Welcome back to another episode of Inside ESG. I'm your host, Maureen Upton, and today I'm excited to have a conversation with Matt Monagle, the forward-thinking CEO and founder of Novo Hydrogen, a company making green hydrogen power a reality for some of the most challenging sectors, such as peak power for big cities and remote mining operations. In this episode, Matt explains what makes hydrogen count as green and why it matters compared to other colors in the so-called hydrogen rainbow. We'll hear about the strategic applications of green hydrogen as Matt sheds light on when and why it becomes the superior choice over other decarbonization strategies. Novo Hydrogen's groundbreaking project in municipal power will provide green hydrogen for the massive peak energy demands of New York City. Matt delves into the unique challenges and opportunities presented by this initiative, including how green hydrogen is a key innovation in long-duration storage, an essential component in resilient and clean energy. Also, we'll hear about Novo Hydrogen's work with a U.S. mining company to power its haul truck fleet with green hydrogen. Stay tuned for an illuminating discussion with Matt Monagle, CEO of Novo Hydrogen, on this edition of Inside ESG. Inside ESG is a timely new production which takes you inside the work of practitioners on the ground, chief risk officers, market analysts, cybersecurity experts, and founders of game-changing startups. We'll talk with specialists in every corner of the globe, across industries and issues, dropping into Argentina to hear about lithium mining, Central Asia for a view of China's Belt and Road Initiative, and West Africa for a perspective on climate risk, among other stops. Hi, Matt. Welcome to the show. It's great to see you again. I wanted to start off by asking, why do you think hydrogen really matters from a climate perspective? Hydrogen matters from a climate perspective for two reasons. One, the vast majority of current hydrogen production is produced from fossil fuels and has associated greenhouse gas emissions in that production, despite being the most abundant element on Earth. It's very rarely found by itself. Therefore, you have to process it. And this processing today encompasses around 2 to 3% of global greenhouse gas emissions, which is a huge problem from a climate perspective. Therefore, we need to clean up current hydrogen production. And then once we do that, there are other uses that clean hydrogen can go towards uh, in getting to a decarbonized economy or society. But can you tell us what are the different types of clean hydrogen? Um, you know, I've heard of the hydrogen rainbow. And, um, you know, last I checked, hydrogen was a colorless gas. So we know that it's not actually green hydrogen. Could you just tell us a little bit about what those different colors, if you will, mean for hydrogen? Yeah, correct. It, it is a colorless gas. And folks created this rainbow, which seems to get a new color added every week. Uh, but the point of this rainbow was to provide a shorthand on how the hydrogen's produced. What really matters, I think, is the carbon intensity of the pathway. But talking through the, the rainbow, uh, the current production is called gray hydrogen, which takes natural gas and goes through a process called steam methane reforming, or SMR, not to be confused with uh, small modular reactors from a nuclear perspective. This industry loves its acronyms. Blue hydrogen is then that same process with carbon capture layered on. And then green hydrogen is a process called electrolysis, where you use electricity. And as long as that electricity is clean or zero carbon, then that resulting hydrogen production is clean. That's green hydrogen. And that's what my company focuses on. Now, I know there's, um, you read every day about more and more use cases for clean hydrogen. Yes, I think that's a really important point that hydrogen can do a lot of things, but that doesn't necessarily mean it should do all those things or is the best tool for the job. 
right now the global hydrogen market is roughly 100 million metric tons per year and the uses are primarily in refining and ammonia production ammonia being the biggest driver of uh, or biggest ingredient in fertilizer but there are other uses as well in metal finishing semiconductor manufacturing some food applications glass manufacturing those are the current uses of hydrogen where it's primarily used for its chemical properties and those are the ones that there aren't any other options for so we need clean hydrogen in order to decarbonize those sectors in addition, hydrogen can be used for producing heat, for producing steam, for producing power, going into a vehicle uh, as a transportation fuel, et cetera. And, and again, to, to your point, there are better and worse use cases there. Uh, and in those cases, there are other options. Let's use transport as an example. You could do a battery electric vehicle or a fuel cell electric vehicle that runs on hydrogen. And there are pros and cons to each of those. One project I know you're working on that I think really proves the point that green hydrogen is not some dream for the future, but actually ready to help power the largest municipality in the U.S. Could you tell us a little bit about that project and how that's coming along? Yes. Uh, and Maureen, you're referring to our project uh, that is physically located in, in New Jersey, uh, but it's electrically connected to New York City, to Brooklyn specifically. But uh, peaker plants, for, for those that don't know, are typically run on natural gas and they're there to produce at high load conditions, which in most places is in the summer when it's super hot and everyone's cranking their, their air conditioning. And obviously a place like New York City, is it's hard to get power there because it is an island and there's obviously not a lot of land to put solar or wind uh, on, on shore. Uh, so we're really excited about this project with, with a great partner. Uh, to be one of the first, as far as we know, where Pika will run not on natural gas, but on green hydrogen. Another way that we think about this project is long duration storage. Obviously, we want to use as much solar and wind as possible, uh, but they are variable. Therefore, you need something from an overall grid mix that you can turn off and on very fast when you need it. And, and that's exactly what this project will do uh, for the five boroughs. Very exciting. And having lived in Manhattan and Brooklyn for many, many years, I'm well aware of the need for air conditioning. Hi, it's Maureen Upton, host and producer of the Inside ESG podcast. I hope you're enjoying this episode. I wanted to take a moment to tell you about Inside ESG's advisory services. If your team could use expert advice in ESG strategy and integration, performance against different metrics and frameworks, or workshop design and facilitation, visit InsideESG.com advisory to see how we might be able to help. Or email info at InsideESG.com. See the show notes for links. Now, let's get back to our episode. One of the main expense items for a large open pit mine and even uh, underground mines is the expense of operating the haul truck fleet and the heavy machinery that has to transport ore around. And so I know sort of the promise of the future for mining would involve hydrogen powered haul truck fleets or heavy equipment. What do you see as the potential for that? And is Nova Hydrogen working in that sector at all? We actually are, Maureen. We have a project uh, with a uh, mining customer on the, the West Coast that we, are, we will be replacing several of their 100-ton haul trucks that are currently powered by an internal combustion engine and diesel fuel. And they will be purchasing and we will be providing the green hydrogen fuel to fuel cell uh, vehicles. And we do think this is a good application for hydrogen going back to the, the last question the the better and worse uses of hydrogen and the reason for that is one these vehicles it's in the name they're hauling 100 tons of material weight matters and they have to have a lot of power batteries can provide that power but the battery that would be needed to do that would be very heavy and in addition these vehicles run 24 7 it's a 24 7 operation therefore refueling or recharging time if it's a battery v really matters and the hydrogen 
uh, certainly shines in, in that regard from a refueling perspective. It's much more akin to refueling with diesel versus the time it would take to refuel or recharge with with batteries so this is certainly an application that that we really like not to mention hard to get the the power to these typically remote or rural uh locations right exactly so well i'll stay tuned that's very exciting for those of us in the mining sector um and many others that have similar problems uh with heavy machinery like that um, you know, I was wondering, so I've heard that one thing that distinguishes Novo Hydrogen is your business model and your sort of um, go-to-market strategy. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I'd be happy to. For us, we only focus on green hydrogen. Now, there are other folks that also focus on green hydrogen or are a pure play hydrogen developer. I've heard that term out there. What distinguishes us is that we call our projects and our go-to-market distributed. And my background is primarily in renewables, specifically solar and battery storage. Now, I do want to emphasize that, at least in the solar space, when I hear distributed, that typically implies small. Our projects are not necessarily small. We do have smaller ones that could be around a megawatt, but we have bigger ones that are in the hundreds of megawatts, but they are always distributed, which to us means on site to the customer or very close to the customer. Hydrogen as the smallest molecule out there, it's hard to move. There's not an existing grid to move it like the, the electric grid or the natural gas grid. Therefore, we have to get that molecule physically to our customers. And to me, the best way to do that is to minimize or eliminate that midstream. So our goal for our customers is to get them the cleanest, most cost-effective, most reliable supply of that clean molecule, which either is on-site or as close as possible. And when I say as close as possible, typically the max we would be would be about 100 miles, but the closer the better. Right. And I would think that the proximity would also correlate a lot with reliability of that source. Absolutely. It, it absolutely does. And the customers that we are targeting, that we are working with, Reliability, resiliency is extremely critical to their operations. Therefore, they take that very seriously. As a contrast, I have done behind the meter solar in the past. And if you put a solar plant on someone's roof, if it doesn't operate, they're still corrected to the grid. So it doesn't impact their operations. However, if hydrogen or whatever fuel is a key part of their operations, they need it to be there in order for their, their manufacturing process or whatever they're doing to function. So that resiliency is extremely important. And on the price side, at the end of the day, the customer cares about a delivered price. So it really doesn't matter the breakdown of production versus delivery. They're paying a delivered price. So that's what we look at. And our calculations have shown that making it closer is how we get to that most cost-effective delivered price to the customer. Right. Delivered is the only thing that matters, right? <laughs> having Correct. it <laughs> close by, but not accessible is uh, really the same thing as having it not close by. Um, great. Well, as we see constantly in the headlines, there's so much talk about hydrogen, both the promise and the reality. And um, so there's some, you know, macroeconomic tailwinds pushing hydrogen forward. I wonder if you wanted to talk about that a little bit. I mean, uh, everybody knows about the Inflation Reduction Act, but there's um, similar legislation around the world and then in both regions um, and, you know, in the climate technology community in general. Do you want to tell us a little bit about uh, some of those tailwinds for you? Absolutely. And for me, I really started looking at hydrogen about four years ago. And it was primarily driven, not necessarily here in the U.S., but overseas in Europe and Asia. And that has certainly translated, that initial momentum has translated here, like you mentioned, to first the infrastructure bill that was passed in November of 2021, had significant hydrogen provisions, some of which are are putting into place to today, and I'll talk about that in a second, as well as the Inflation Reduction Act. For me, I founded Novo Hydrogen before those were bills, and I've learned in my career never to, to count on federal legislation in, until it's passed. But uh, I certainly saw clean hydrogen 
as a bipartisan initiative and obviously something that was getting a lot more focus from a decarbonization perspective. Again, like we talked about earlier, given that current hydrogen production is several percent of global greenhouse gas emissions and therefore is a problem we need to address. The Specifically in the infrastructure bill, uh, eight billion was allocated to the Department of Energy, uh, specifically a group within the DOE called OSED or the Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations to create at least four hydrogen hubs throughout the country. The DOE announced the winners of that on October 13th. There were seven, but we are really happy that one of our projects uh, is part of the Pacific Northwest hub. That was one of the seven that was awarded. Uh, there's not too much I can say other than that. Uh, we have strict guidelines from DOE. However, we're super excited about that project uh, and others that are happening throughout the industry in this program. And then, of course, the Inflation Reduction Act was extremely catalytic. Yeah. Well, um, so the macro environment is definitely pushing the industry along, um, but there's also some other uh, externalities um, that are a challenge. Um, you know, interest rates come to mind although perhaps they're cooling off a bit. Do you want to talk about any of those factors? Yes, certainly interest rates are extremely impactful for infrastructure in general and specifically uh, energy transition or climate tech infrastructure. And, and for me personally, most of my career has been in the low to zero <laughs> interest rate in, environment. So this is certainly new and we've had to adjust. Uh, and, and I think we'll, we're certainly monitoring what's, what's happening and, and, and we'll act a, accordingly. Uh, it, it's by no means for our business uh, a, a deal killer, but it does impact the cost of debt. And because these projects have relatively high capex or upfront costs, the, the lower the interest rates, the, the more cost effective the end product is, in, in our case, hydrogen. In addition, there's certainly uh, geopolitical instability throughout the world. Uh, I think that also has, especially the the war in Ukraine, has really shown a light on the volatility of commodities like natural gas, where Russia cut off their natural gas supplies to Europe, which triggered uh, a mad scramble to replace that with with other means, typically or mostly LNG imports. Uh, but that has really highlighted that volatility of those commodities that folks took for granted. Uh, for, for a while. So energy security is absolutely a much bigger concern and is impacted by this geopolitical uh, instability. And it's something that we have to deal with and and work through with our customers. Right. Exactly. Well, it appears that flexibility is the key to success. And again, being closer, I think, adds to that resiliency and, and tries to minimize some of those those externalities as much as possible. What sort of point do you think is most important to uh, to take away from our conversation for stakeholders, be they investors or consumers who are interested in uh, approaching net zero for different industries or our society in general? Green hydrogen is certainly a solution and a key solution, but by no means is it the only solution. Uh, I, I've heard people say, right, we don't want to be a hammer and see everything as a nail. We really want to focus on, and I would encourage people to look at the right applications for green hydrogen. And then if it's not the right application, and we're talking in the decarbonized context, there are other solutions that'll make more or less sense based on the end use, as well as the, the local uh, geographical uh, lo location. So unfortunately, there is a lot of nuance with green, green hydrogen. That's why I have a lot of fun working in it and why our company is fully focused there. There's plenty for us to do. But again, it doesn't mean it's the only solution out there. We need everything from a decarbonization perspective in our toolkit in order to reach our goals. You know, that's a really refreshing perspective, I have to say, because I think that um, all of the different types of renewables and carbon reduction strategies competing against each other and uh, perhaps you know, being naysayers of each other's uh, prospects is really, uh, it's a lose-lose for all of us. So, uh, you know, I appreciate you saying that, um, you know, green hydrogen is part of an overall solution. So thanks for making that point. And uh, yeah, so Matt, thanks very much for joining me today for this conversation. Very interesting. And I look forward to paying attention to Novo Hydrogen's developments. 
It's my pleasure and really appreciate the opportunity. I'm, I'm a voracious podcast listener, specifically energy podcasts, including your own. So uh, this is a treat for me and, and, and thank you. Thanks for joining us today. To make sure you don't miss out on our next episode, subscribe to the Inside ESG podcast on Spotify or any podcast platform, the YouTube channel, the LinkedIn newsletter, and our mailing list on InsideESG.com. See you next time.